just after 9-11 and just before the United States went into Afghanistan. I was awoken one morning to the sounds of bombs exploding. Explosion after explosion. My heart started racing, and in that moment between sleeping and waking, I thought that we were being bombed. But the reality was that I lived just a few miles from Camp Pendleton in Southern California. It is a large marine air base, and they were doing military exercises in preparation for going into Afghanistan and Iraq. They were real bombs, but they weren't going to hurt me. And the next moment I thought, but they were preparing to bomb somebody. And that somewhere soon, someone was going to wake up and hear similar bombs, but they were not going to be a simulation. They were going to be real and deadly. This month, we have been reflecting on sanctuary as our theme. On our first Sunday, we asked, what does sanctuary look like for you? And some of you answered. But when Douglas asked me to provide a sermon topic for this month, I don't know entirely why, but my first thought was, what happens when home is no longer home? And then I gave him a title. I didn't know exactly what I meant by it, or what had been percolating inside me that that title sprung to mind. But as it turns out, in the past almost 20 years since 9-11, the number of people fleeing violence and becoming displaced persons and refugees has skyrocketed. Ongoing conflicts, some large, some localized, have caused people to flee those places they once thought of as home, as sanctuary. In the past five years, we have witnessed the highest levels of displacement on record. 68.5 million people have been displaced worldwide, according to the United Nations High Commission on Refugees. The majority of refugees come from just three countries, South Sudan, Syria, and Afghanistan. Apparently, the aforementioned bombs hit their targets and continue to hit their targets in a never-ending conflict. But I think what brought this home to me most in recent months was the moment when our current administration started separating families at the border. And we began to see, and let's face it, continue to see, children who have been removed from their parents, some with very little chance of being reunited with them anytime soon. And the questions arise. What brings parents to the place where they risk losing their children? What makes people flee everything they know to attempt the unknown? Of course, war and violence are obvious reasons, but violence can take many forms. Poverty, hunger, desperation. When these are an everyday occurrence, then structural forms, as well as direct forms of violence, are also at play and also have direct bearing on what causes people to flee. As I was searching for answers, I came across a poignant poem. It's called Home, by the Somali-born British poet Warsan Shire. The poem begins, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. I was looking at pictures of Aleppo, Syria before the war. It was a beautiful city, a thriving metropolis filled with ancient buildings, stunning architecture, beautiful open-air gathering spaces, thriving markets, historic hotels. It was one of the three oldest inhabited cities in human history. It is now mostly rubble. Millions have fled. 
You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. We can only imagine their desperation. In preparation for writing my sermon, I viewed the documentary film, Human Flow, from director A.Y.Y. It captures the plight of refugees as they flow from violence in Syria, Eritrea, Sudan, Myanmar, and Central America. The film is at once visually stunning and chillingly heartrending. The opening scenes show an inflatable lifeboat overstuffed with people in bright orange life jackets being hauled ashore by refugee workers on the coast of Greece. The people on the boats are refugees from Syria who have made it just that far. They get on the boats and cross the Mediterranean Sea in the hope of safety and relief from violence. And as I watch this, I am reminded of another line from Morsan Shire's poem. You have to understand, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. And then we see families rifling through what is left of their burnt out homes, rats nesting in torn and scorched furniture before they must move on. Because again, home is no longer home. There is nothing left. You only run from the border when the whole city is running as well. The film follows the refugees as they make their way on foot from the coast of Greece into the interior. They pull wheelie bags behind them or carry backpacks, sometimes with a small child balanced on their hips. When the filmmaker interviews them, they tell him they are headed to Germany, where they will be welcomed. Angela Merkel, despite much opposition, has promised refuge. Their plan is to walk through Central Europe to Germany. So I looked on a map. I wanted to see where Germany was in relationship to Northern Greece. Let me tell you, it's not close. And in real time, I have been following the Honduran caravan of refugees fleeing violence and poverty in Central America. As they have been traveling northward since last weekend, they have been collecting more and more people until by yesterday, this parade of about 2,000 people gathered at the Guatemalan Mexican border. Streaming across the bridge that connects the two countries, they were able to break through the locked gate, preventing them from entering Mexico. Their mood was celebratory and triumphant. They are, with great hope, heading toward a more stable life. But Mexican authorities, in conversation with our administration, have tried to protect their southern border. The caravan was met by police in riot gear, lobbing tear gas into the crowd. Our president, at a rally of his supporters, called the caravan bad people and told his supporters we were not going to let them in. We need it, he said, to protect our borders. His plan is to seal our southern border and send a military presence down there, just in case the Mexican authorities are not successful in stopping the caravan from heading northward. One of the recurring images in the film, Human Flow, was the images of fences, gates, barbed wire, and walls. When the Syrian refugee families reached the border of Greece and Macedonia, the gateway to the rest of Europe, they find a tall wire fence surrounded by barbed wire. In the previous year, that border had been fluid allowing over a million refugees to pass through. But a wave of xenophobia and fear had spread through Europe, and borders were closing everywhere. Even if Angela Merkel and Germany were willing to accept the refugees, there was no way for them to get there. 
And the film leaves us with the images of the refugees, tents sitting in puddles of mud, waiting. And some refugees from all over other parts of the world had found their way to France and had set up a makeshift community in Calais. They found themselves displaced once again as the French authorities burned down their tents or crushed them with cranes and backhoes. I watched as the refugees hugged those friends they had made in the camp and then move on. This has also hit us. In 2016, we accepted close to 16,000 Syrian refugees. In 2017, around 3,000. But in the first half of this year, we accepted 11. And our administration has lowered our refugee numbers to 30,000 a year, the lowest amount ever. Something happens to us when we close off compassion, when we suppress empathy. When we do that, writes UU Minister Erica Hewitt, we've lost a bit of our soul. She continues, that's what fear does. Fear is a voice that says, nothing matters more than self-preservation and self-importance. Fear drains the antifreeze out of your heart so your compassion center runs cold. It cuts off the feeding tubes that keep our souls supple and our morality intact. And though we may not be directly complicit in our country's response, we do have the ability to turn away, to not see, because most of us wake up in warm beds and have running water and enough food to eat. Most of us do not have to worry whether we will have a country again, or a home again, or a job again. But we do not have to turn away. There are things we can do. I spent Friday evening talking with Floriana Blanton from the group Ithaca Welcomes Refugees. Ithaca Welcomes Refugees started as a totally volunteer-run organization in 2015 as the result of collective community reaction to the global refugee crisis. The group works to resettle refugees and at-risk immigrants, providing basic services from apartment setup, basic needs support, emergency assistance, and orientation to the community. They also work on long-term support for refugees, providing them with translation support, ESL training, and connect them with others in the community who speak their language. She told me that two years ago they had collected enough furniture to outfit apartments for the 50 refugee families who had been vetted and were supposed to resettle in Ithaca. Because of our, our unstable immigration policies of late, those families never came. Catholic Charities of Tompkins County Office for Refugee Resettlement with whom Ithaca Welcomes Refugees works closely, has had to shut down its operations because not enough refugees are coming in to be resettled. It is not because there are not enough refugees in the world who would want that opportunity. Floriana says they have shifted their emphasis in the last couple of years. They are working on providing additional services for the refugees that are already here taking on more of the burden for rent, medical care, and child care. Her favorite project is called the Global Roots Play School that provides child care services for children 18 months through five years old. And these services occur simultaneously with the ESL classes for the adults. Women, she said, had been having a hard time being able to take ESL classes because of inaccessible child care. But this program both gives women the access to childcare, but more importantly, keeps them from becoming isolated as they form community connections with the other participants of the ESL classes. The Play School also raises money by offering their services to non-refugee members of the community who pay, pay full price for childcare. This also gives the refugee children fluent English-speaking peers 
who can help them learn English more quickly. Floriana gave me flyers that give more information on Ithaca Welcomes Refugees and the Global Roots Play School. And you can get these from me after the service if you would like. Ithaca Welcomes Refugees are most in need of financial donations to keep the play school running and for providing emergency assistance for heat and rent during the winter months. And since they are completely volunteer run, all donations go to direct services for refugee families. Ai Weiwei ends the film Human Flow with a quote from the Syrian astronaut Mohammed Fares, who had seen the world from space. He said, all human beings live in one big nation as peoples. Syrians, Indians, Chinese, and Americans all live together on this beautiful planet, and we must share. We all must share. Protecting the planet can only happen with solidarity and love. Without manipulation, without injustice, without killing, and without suppression. The final image of the film is thousands and thousands of blue and bright orange life vests scattered on a beach. I was making myself a cup of tea while I was writing this. It was one of those yogi tea bags that have the little sayings on them. Mine said, when you act with compassion, you will never be wrong. I think that's right. Amen, and blessed be.